Hi, I'm glad we could get together again and share God's word today. So I wanted to ask you a question right to start with. Is God judging America? Does he do that? We've heard over and over that God loves us. We know that's true. It's the whole Bible's full of God's love, his patience, his endurance with people, his slowness to judge, and all of those things. But here's another truth about God, that God is a judge, that he is sovereign, that there's nobody above him. He has absolute power. One of the names of God, he is king of kings and Lord of lords. And so the whole Bible talks about how God is the head of everything. Of course, we could say creator. That you can't get any more the head of everything than being the creator, right? You're the originator, the designer, the creator, all the things on the set. God is above. And so is God judging America? What do you think? About half the people in surveys think that with what's happening with between coronavirus and uh, Antifa, uh, the smoke that was in the Northwest and people lighting fires, that God is judging America. The division between the political parties, the closeness and the nearness to a one world currency and a one world government, all these things threaten to bring down America at a small level or a larger level. And so I asked the question, is God judging America? This is one pastor's opinion. The answer, I think, is yes. And now there's a difference between the wrath of God and the judgment of God. The judgment of God is always meant to bring people back to a place that they need to be before God, with God, under God. And the wrath of God is really talked about in the book of Revelation, where there's three sets of seven judgments that will happen in what's called the tribulation period, a seven-year period, where God is pouring out his wrath on the world. In God's judgment, there's mercy. That's how I would say it. In God's judgment, there is mercy. So God's brought judgment on your life, for things you've said or done, and he's brought circumstances around. And that's how some of you have come to believe in Jesus, that you came to a place where you realize, this isn't the way I want to live. This isn't who I want to be. This isn't really who I am. And you were brought by the Holy Spirit. You couldn't come to God without the Holy Spirit bringing you to a place of judgment of your own life and your own sins to make you realize I need Jesus. I need a Savior. I won't make it to heaven like this. I think I went about a year of my life. Happened about my senior year of high school. I went about a year thinking about hell, thinking about heaven. And I wasn't raised in a church or I wasn't religious or anything like that in any way, shape, or form. I generally believed in God. I generally believed in Jesus. I generally believed I was a pretty good person. But I came to a place in my life where I realized I wouldn't make it to heaven. I don't know why I thought that, but I thought, I'm not going to make it to heaven. I wonder how you know that you make it to heaven. I didn't know then that it was the Holy Spirit personally bringing me to a place where I would answer to God and just say, God, I need you in my life. And my life changed from right there. I've been different. I've had a relationship with God, LTR, long-term relationship with God. And that's the way that it works. So God brings personal judgment for what people have done. The scripture says some men's sins come before them. Some men's sins trail after them. In other words, they won't get judged for it until eternity. But uh, sooner or later, we're accountable to God as judge. Now, that's not a narrative that's even said in church all the time, because it gives some bad vibrations. And, you know, we want good vibes, even in church. But the truth is what we must seek in our life, whether we're a believer or not a believer. I thought it was very interesting to watch one of the scientists involved in the pandemic, a Chinese scientist, and uh, she was assigned, I saw on YouTube, 
after the fact to go in and investigate it. And what she investigated was is that it was in a laboratory. It was not a bat in a market a few blocks from the lab. And so that was the cover-up story. And she escaped from China. Her life was in danger. And so here I didn't know or hear anything about belief or faith. Or, of course, questions like that really weren't asked. But uh, in a 10-minute video, what I saw, she said, it was my obligation to society. That's not a quote. That's a paraphrase. It's my obligation to people to let them know the truth about this. You know what? If that is said and nothing's discussed about faith, whether she has that or not personally, we who know the truth about God and about Jesus, we're obligated to live a life of truth. That has to do with God's love it also has to do with God's truth. Let me read a scripture that I think is kind of disturbing, but under the talking about the truth, uh, here's what it says. In 1 Peter 4, 17 and 8, it talks about judgment. And I want you to hear this. It says, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, that is those of us that are believers, are involved in God's church. If it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? In other words, the opportunity for salvation. It says in the next verse of the two, and if it is difficulty that the righteous be saved, what will become of the godless man or and or sinner? And so referring to somebody who has imperfect, but doesn't acknowledge God. And so in other words, judgment starts about with people who know the truth about Jesus. And there's a responsibility that goes with that. Sometimes the narrative can be something like, you know, uh, God's going to solve all our problems. And that's definitely a real truth to that. But the other thing is, is that we're accountable for what we know. So I mentioned values and I mentioned judgment. So the story in Daniel today Daniel's name is entitled, God is my judge. That's what his name means. So I want to talk to you about a word that I used to hear more, but maybe we need to hear a little bit more. And when I do hear it, it doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. I want to talk to you about the word values. So values is a person's principle or standards of behavior. What are the standards for their behavior? One's judgment of what is important in life. They inside or internalize maybe their parents' rules or the values that are handed down to them. Now, religious values are the Ten Commandments. Have you heard of the Ten Commandments? Could you name five? Let's see. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness or lie. Thou shalt not... Okay. Could you fill in the blanks? Okay. So do you realize that our law, our system of law, is based on the Ten Commandments. In the United States of America, in the Supreme Court, the Ten Commandments are carved up there <laughs> and in the Supreme Court room. The laws are laws of God. And we're seeing a conflict between religious belief and other people's values that are different. And yet they're talked about as values. And so what I want to say is, is that in a society, the values in the United States come from God. And so the Ten Commandments are those main things. And that's where it's not honorable to steal. It's not honorable to lie. It's not honorable to et cetera, et cetera. The, it says, no other gods before me. And that seems kind of irrelevant as many people really say unbelief is their main belief. And that's different than it used to be. And still, with all of that, about 70% of the American people in surveys say that they believe in God. But there is a big gap between what they believe and what they live out. I call that being a Christian atheist. You know, being a Christian in your reception of Jesus and belief in God, and yet an atheist in the way that it doesn't have anything to do with morality or behavior or the way that person lives. 
And I'm suggesting today that God is saying there needs to be a closure in that gap that what we believe, that is morals of God, should be a part of our life. Now we understand nobody lives the perfect life. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about having and embracing God's values. And you know, that's a lot of the argument uh, politically about abortion. There are many, many believers that say uh, the Bible teaches that the life of a person starts with conception, and they believe that because of the Bible. Other people say, well, basically it's a blob of flesh, and, and we can do whatever we want. And abortion is a common form of birth control. And, and so it's coming up in the political arena all the time with the Supreme Court judge that was just confirmed or went through Senate hearings and is in the process of confirmation. It comes up all the time. And it's really a hot button issue along with many others that are different sets of values. And so here's what I wanna say. Beside values, there's a person uh, who has their own personal convictions. And that is, is that based on the Ten Commandments. They might have religious values, personal convictions that I'm going to try to live out my faith according to what God says. And then somebody else, I'm just going to live my life according to whatever I think, or how about this one, whatever I feel, uh, based on basic morality. I'm not hurting anybody. There's a big conflict in the way that people live. And so I just want to give you the example of a guy named Daniel today. And Daniel lived in a time where he was living in a place called Babylon. Let me read you just a couple verses here. That when he was a teenager, what happened is Daniel was taken hostage as Babylon, the powerful kingdom, went up and they beat the Egyptians. And then they came down to Jerusalem and they took many of the young people and most of the people who were not infirmed or crippled or most of them they took into captivity as slaves and walked them back to Babylon. Daniel, along with three friends of his that were teenagers, they were taken back to Babylon in slavery. And, and it says this in the Bible, it starts to tell that story. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, seeing the uh, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put it in the treasury house of his God. He, the people were defeated and the treasury was uh, taken, all the articles of gold and that kind of thing. The people of God living in Israel at that time, they were taken into captivity in Babylon. And here's what I want to introduce to the point. Babylon is a type or a picture or an image. It was a real place, a real king with real people. But through the scripture is also a symbolic image of the world. A uh, book of the Bible, uh, we see that Genesis tells us about Babylon. And it was going to be the world's first one world government. And it was headed up by a guy named Nimrod. And basically, they wanted to push God out and wanted to make a world without God, where it would be a big city and they'd protect one another. And so it's called the law of first mention. And so Babylon is a type of the world that is a city, a worldview without God. In the book of Revelation, uh, way ahead of us, yet we see a future Babylon, and it's talking about Babylon will be the center of commerce, it will be the center of worldliness, and Babylon will fall. It will be anti-God, and so we have Babylon way in the past, and we have Babylon in the last book of the Bible, Revelation way in the future, both stand for a type of the world. Now Daniel was taken in and to Babylon, and he lived in a place that was hostile to God, was anti-Jewish, anti-God, because they had their gods, I want to say, small g. Uh, and so all these, uh, and they asked the question and taunted them, I'm sure, all the way back 
while they were in slavery, where is your God? How could your God let this happen? Our gods defeated your gods. And what happened was it was a place of judgment. God judged his people. He allowed King Nebuchadnezzar to be used. He even predicted through the prophet Jeremiah it would be 70 years. It was also predicted ahead of time that there would be another king uh, named Cyrus that would let the Jews go back to their land after 70 years. And of course, we know, looking back now, that that happened exactly that way. Literally, Cyrus was predicted by name about 150 years before he ever lived. And yet, we see that this happened. And so, God is in control of things, as I mentioned, a sovereign king, and yet, God judges. And so, what happened with Daniel that I want to tell you about is that here is somebody who loved God. He was in the Jewish land and, uh, and then taken hostage. And then what happens is he's a part of the most happening place in the whole world. And he was judged as one of the smartest, brightest, him and his friends, uh, intelligent in every way. And they were put into the king's service. And so what happened is they were going to be retrained. Let me read it to you like this. These are the words I used out of Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. This isn't the verses, but they were re-educated. They were conditioned. They were brainwashed. They were indoctrinated. They were fed the very best food. They were really trained and brought from hostages to civil servants. That was the way of Babylon. And so they were going to take the smartest, the brightest, and the best. And it says, and they were very handsome in their looks. And so they had it all, these people that were taken captive from Judah. And yet all of a sudden they were living in a whole different world. It's a picture of believers today in God and in the Bible, Christians, if you will, um, that are living in a world that's hostile toward God. And so what do we see here? We see the erosion in America of biblical values. We see uh, all the different things, people immersed in materialism, and all these different things rather than putting God first in their life. And so Daniel thrived, although he was in a difficult environment, uh, he thrived spiritually because he was close to God. And so Daniel 1.8 summarizes and brings to a point everything that I want to tell you right here. This is the main idea of the message. Everything said was to bring it right to this intersection for you right here. And if you're a real believer and a follower of Jesus and you're working at it and you have faith in God and you're not taking the easy road, not the broad road that leads to destruction talked about in Matthew 7, but the narrow road. You're really trying to live out your faith. This is for you right here. It says in Daniel 1.8, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Let me just say to you about the royal food and wine. It wasn't bad food. It was the king's food right from the king's table. It was the very best you could have. But Daniel identified as a Jewish person, as a person of God, and he didn't want to eat this probably because it was sacrificed to idols. It could have been non-kosher or pork. It could have been strangled and still had blood in it, and they were forbidden as in their diet to you know, eat that. But probably... Daniel remembered no other gods before me out of the Ten Commandments. And he identified as a person of God. And so because of the power of choice, uh, the power of choice, Daniel turned down the royal food and wine, and he asked to be fed pulse, vegetables, seeds, you know, a plain diet that was acceptable to Hebrews. And the point is, is, this is he, it was about diet for him. About us, it's not about diet as much. It's about everything in our life. And that is, so let me finish reading. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And so it worked out where he didn't. And they had a 10-day test. 
And the 10-day test went out like this. Daniel and his three friends looked as well or better than the others who ate from the king's table. And so he was allowed to do that. But it's really more about identity than food. So I ask you this question. What makes you, you? Is it your heredity? Is it the family traditions? The family you come from? Is it your personality? Is it the fact that you're an inward person and your temperament or outward? All the different things that can be part of a person. Is it the unique set of circumstances that make you different? That could be all these things or factors in who you are. But I want to just show you that a power of choice is also a huge thing in how you identify. And so we're not talking about do you identify as male or female or as the big controversy is, somewhere in between. I'm talking about something way bigger than that issue. The issue of do you identify as a person of God? Do you identify as a person of faith? Daniel did, and it made all the world a difference. In his life, in a dangerous place where he was taken as a hostage, God blessed him and God put his favor on him because God honored Daniel because Daniel always honored God. And so when we honor God, just understand we will have the favor of God. Daniel served between four kings. And when the end of it came, he never went back from Babylon to Jerusalem. Even after the 70 years were over and he was an old man, he was still living for God. And he survived a, a lion's den he was thrown into and, and all kinds of twists and turns in his life where he could have died several times. But the favor of God was with him. And so this is the story of identity. And I just want to read a few things and I'm hoping that, that you identify with this. You ready? Do you identify with God because you have been forgiven of your sins? All my sins are forgiven before God and God will not condemn me for bad things I've done, for good things I've left undone, evil things I've said, or wrong things I've thought. It's about being forgiven. Are you really forgiven of your sins? Who are you? By the power of choice, you are a follower of Christ. I am reconciled to God. I am rescued by Christ. I am redeemed, which means to be bought back. That when Jesus died on the cross, you recognize and identify with that. I believe that. I believe he died in my place as a substitute for my sins. And I've received him as my savior. That's the reason I'm going to heaven. Now, if you did ask a lot of people, I'm sure if we just walked out onto a college campus or high school or we walked down the street or we went down to the beach, right, went down to the river on a nice day, and we just started asking people, why do you think God should let you into heaven? I think a lot of people would say this. I think I'm a good person. I've done more good than bad, and I've done some bad things, but I've done way more good. You know, really, that's the wrong answer. The trouble is, there's only one right answer. The only one right answer is, I think I'll go to heaven because Jesus died in my place on the cross, and I believe in the Son of God, and so he's my Savior. That's the right answer. Every other answer about works or our own goodness will never work. And so uh, I go on to read a few more before we close here. It says, I am bought with a price and belong to God. I am known by God. I've been known and cared about all along by God. God has been watching out for me in the beginning, and God has cared for me from day one. I'm known by God because I believe the Bible. By my own choice, I realize I am chosen, and I choose to love God back. God chose me. I am justified before God. God has declared me innocent because of what Jesus has done. I am accepted, Romans 15, 7, 1 Peter 2, 10. I have been welcomed by God into the kingdom of God, and, and heaven is in my future. I am no longer rejected. I am no longer an outsider. I am accepted by God. Have you heard this term? I'm saved. And so it says in Romans 5, 8, it talks about being saved. 
and just right along with it, I have been rescued from God's just anger, from my sin, from myself. Oh, sometimes we need to be rescued from ourselves. Would you agree with that? Sometimes we need to be rescued from ourselves. More importantly, from death, from Satan and a sinful system. And so I am saved. I am rescued. One or two more. I am loved. I believe God deeply loves me. Who would send their son that has absolute power and doesn't need me, but chooses to love me just as I am? Wow, that's so, so powerful. And then finally, I am taken care of. I am secure in God's hands. I will not be abandoned. God will complete his work in me. He has sent the Holy Spirit to live inside me. And God will supply what I need in this kind of world. And, and so God isn't taking everybody out of the world right away. God is letting people live their life out, but with faith in him. That was Daniel. He identified above all the things that made him who he was. So it doesn't talk about Daniel's personality. It just says he had favor with people. Uh, it doesn't talk about, you know, uh, all kinds of other things, his temperament. It doesn't talk about that. And, but what it does talk about is his choice. And that's what I end on today is that the power of your choices, that your future can be greater than your past, the power of your choices to make your family better than the family maybe that you came out of, to make your future experiences better than the ones that you've had in the past. The power of choice, the power of faith, and the power to believe what God says, and the power to really know that you are loved, embraced, accepted, and that you can have a relationship with God as a regular person. That power will change your life, will change the life of people that you meet, and change your future. There's a good future waiting for you. So look past Corona, look past an election, Look past the strife, the division all around you. Look past the discouragement. Look past our current situation. And maybe look forward more. And then how about this? Finally, how about looking up to realize when you look up to the heavens, know this. There's a God who truly loves you. The Holy Spirit is drawing you to him. And he has a wonderful, a great plan for your life. And there's nothing that you won't give up that God won't give you something better, perhaps in this world, but for sure in the world to come. God bless you. Would you join me in prayer? God, I pray for each person here today that's with me through this camera. Lord, at this hour and the hours that this is posted, I pray that this prayer will go into their lives. I pray you protect them. I pray that you will draw them to you. I pray that you will cause many to walk out of discouragement into the encouragement of God. I pray, God, that faith will fill our choices for the future. I pray that you'll move, just remove the weight off our shoulders uh, to take it on yourself. Help us, God, with true faith and trying in uncertain times. And Lord, let me be a person of faith that I never thought I could be. And God, please make me the person who I was meant to be. In Jesus' name, thank you, God, for your forgiveness and your love. Amen. Let it be so. Let it be so. Believe God. Things are going to get better. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Hope to see you next time. Bye now.